That means if I become serious about Islam, then or if I start taking my religion seriously, then I'm probably not going to live a happy life. Because anything that makes me happy is probably forbidden. So I'm not going to have the friends that I have, I'm not going to do the activities that I do, I'm not going to do anything that actually brings any joy in my life, and I'm going to be miserable. And if you think, and you start thinking, maybe that's not true. Maybe, because I've heard Islam, if you follow it, it gives you peace, it gives you happiness, maybe I should. But then you look at people in your family, friends, that used to not be very religious, and then Allah put something in their hearts and they became religious. Now the problem with that is, a lot of times when people find Islam later on in life, they have a lot of guilty conscience for the life they used to live before. So they try to become more Islamic than Islam itself. Right? So they also develop this narrative that they have to be constantly angry. They, are, they look upset all the time. Every time you see them or they see you, they're giving you a fatwa, they're giving you a khutbah, they're telling you how you're going to burn in hell if you don't change your ways. And they're, they just look miserable. They look miserable. And they look disconnected, like they used to have friends, they don't have any more. They used to get along with family, they don't get along with them anymore. Everybody's fitna, everybody's facade, everybody's corruption. I want to protect myself, I don't want to be in their gatherings, etc, etc. The more closer to deen you become, the more your cousin becomes a fitna, your uncle becomes a fitna, your, your parents become a fitna, your spouse becomes a fitna, and you're, you're just sitting in the masjid, or you're just on your own, cut off. And you're, you, then you start getting the impression, well, I don't want to get closer to Islam. Because if I come any closer to the religion, I'm going to become like that. I don't want to be like that. No, thank you. I'd rather live a happy life. So you know what people even de have developed? They've developed the impression, hey, are you Islamic or are you normal? Okay, are you like Muslim or are you like Muslim Muslim? You know, what that means is that if you become closer to Allah's deen, then somehow you lose your ability to be normal. And that did not come from anywhere. It didn't come from a vacuum. There's actual real behavior of people that makes it seem like the closer to religion you get, the more abnormal you become, the more antisocial you become, the angrier you become, the more judgmental you become, the more miserable you become. So why would that be something that you would want in your life? Why? When you find the impression that people got of the Prophet ﷺ when they met him and knew nothing about him. They knew nothing about him and they would meet him. They would want to stay in his company. His smile was captivating. Like companions describe, he was almost always smiling. And you know, today there's a direct proportion. The longer your beard gets, the tougher your, your harsh face becomes. Like, like it just gets grumpier and grumpier. It's a direct proportionality <laughs> between those two things. That's a problem. That's a very serious problem. In any case, this is the impression not some non-Muslims have of Islam. This is the impression there are a lot of young people sitting here in the audience that have of Islam. There are young professionals that are now married and are, are, are having children of their own. They have this impression of Islam. And if you have this impression of Islam, why wouldn't you be scared to even come into a masjid? Why would you attend an Islamic program? Why would you come to a halaqa? Why would you go to a convention? Because when, you, when somebody says, hey, there's this national convention happening, or there's this speech happening, or this program happening, you're like, I don't, I don't go to those people. That's the scary stuff. Have you seen those people, the way they look at you? No, thank you. I would rather have a normal evening. So we've given the, we've, forget scaring non-Muslims from Islam, we've scared our own from Islam. We've terrified them. We, this is the problem. I haven't yet discussed any part of the solution. In my mind, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, there are a few things that you and I need to do to engage that solution. Now maybe you're the ones listening to me right now. Some of you actually have these uh, impressions. Maybe, maybe you carry some of these opinions. And I'm not criticizing you for carrying these opinions. I can relate that they came from somewhere. And I'll be honest with you, some of these opinions I carried myself at some point in my youth. I had this impression of Islam. I certainly did. When I was in college, I saw a guy with a beard, with a, with a flyer for the, the MSA meeting. I went the other way. I was like, no, 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 thanks. I'm not doing that, you know. One time there was a, a, a the family, friends, they had a funeral. And that was the one time in high school I went to the masjid. I didn't go to Jum'ah, my entire high school. I didn't go to Jum'ah. And I went this one time to the masjid and the, the imam of the masjid, you know, drove me, uh, me back home. So this is the, I, I'm scared to death because the guy is like, you know, super imam guy. And I'm this kid from high school. And he's telling me, you know, if you really want to go to Jannah, then you have to, uh, 
you know, spend time learning Islam and you have to get away from, and I, I told him, he said, what do you do? I told him I like playing basketball, I do this, that, the other. Yeah, you have to leave these things and you have to, and I was like, whoa, I need to get out of this car. Can I get out while it's still moving? You know, <laughs> and that's the impression I had. And it was terrifying to me. Now, what do we do about that? What are we supposed to do about that? I would argue, and I, I said this in a subtle way before, but I'll, I'll be more explicit now. I would argue the impression we have given people about Allah, we as an ummah, the impression we have given people about Allah is not actually the way Allah presents Himself. Allah speaks Himself a certain way, of, about Himself, introduces Himself a certain way, but we talk about Allah a certain other way. In other words, our narrative of Islam is very far from the narrative of the Qur'an itself. That's Allah speaking Himself. You know when people that don't know a lot about Islam ask a question, Hey, why does it say in the Qur'an this, this, this? You've heard this question, but why does it say in the Qur'an this, this, this? Think about the language of that question. Why does it say this? Why does he say this? That's Allah talking. But the level of disconnect is so powerful that in your mind, this is just a book and it says, it speaks. In your mind, it's no longer clear that it's in fact the one who made you and loves you more than anyone ever will. And the one who takes care of every breath you take in and every breath you take out. And every beat of your heart is the one speaking to you here. That thought is gone. It's just an it that says something. And now you have questions about it. This is a disconnect from Allah speaking Himself. There are lots of people that even if they don't consider themselves religious, when they're in times of trouble, they turn to prayer. They make dua to Allah. Ya Allah, just show me a way. I don't know what to do. Give me some guidance. I need, I need a way out of this mess. And they come and they say, they'll say, maybe even say to me, say to others, I keep praying for a solution. I keep praying for some direction. I don't get it. Why isn't Allah giving me help? Why isn't He guiding me? Well, I'm here to tell you something. For all of those, those of you that have had those instances where you're praying to Allah, you're asking for an answer, and you're, you seem to not be able to find that answer. Allah, you keep asking Allah and He's not giving it to you. It's because He already did. He already did. He spoke to you. Risalati Rabbi, the Qur'an is called messages or letters from my master. He wrote these letters to you, to you and me, for what we go through, for the problems you and I have. Why do you think in the Fatiha we recite, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim? Guide us. Tell me, tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. When, you, when you're at a loss, you're in trouble, you don't know who to turn to, you don't know what the answer could be. Then you personally, how many times have you per asked yourself this question? I can't answer it for you, I can only answer it for myself. How many times when you're at a loss, you're in trouble, you're, you don't know what to do, you've just opened Allah's book and said, Ya Allah, just tell me what to do. Let me find the answer in your words. In your words. And you know what's so sad about that? It's that for a huge majority of Muslims, we've even made that difficult. This book came for you to connect to Allah directly. We know that for a fact, because when you stand in salah, you're supposed to recite, when you're standing, you're supposed to recite Qur'an. And you're supposed to pay attention to the Qur'an you're reciting. That in and of itself is explicit proof that there's no scholar between you and Allah. There's no mufassir between you and Allah. There is no, no someone more knowledgeable between you and Allah interpreting it for you. It's just you, the words of Allah and Allah. That's it. That's the connection between you and Allah. It's the rope that connects you to Allah directly, the Qur'an. 